welcome back to Atman Unlimited. Last week we did a video on Coolant 101 where we discussed how to mix coolant properly, the different types of coolants, how to maintain your coolant properly, and that video got a, a lot of success. So there were a lot of good questions asked from that video and we got a lot of positive reviews from that video. So people asked for a little bit of continuation on that video and more importantly they asked about how a flood coolant system specifically works and then they also asked for some more detailed information on the homemade do-it-yourself oil skimmer that I made. So we're going to go over that uh, in detail in this video uh, this week. So let's take a tour of the machine and we'll look at the different components and how a flood coolant system uh, is actually comprised on a, a more industrial machine. So everything starts here. So this is the sump for the machine. This sump holds approximately 35 gallons and this is where the coolant resides when the machine's not being used. From the sump we've got a coolant pump so this machine has an eighth horsepower, one eighth horsepower uh, coolant pump, and it's just a standard uh, impeller pump. There's a shaft that runs down into the bottom of the coolant tank, and then there's just a little impeller wheel up there, and it pumps the coolant out. From there, you can't see it under the panel here, but I've got a, a ball valve, and then this red hose here is for my wash down hose. So I just use a wash down hose with a garden hose nozzle on it rather than an air spray. And uh, it works a lot better for flushing chips out. And then uh, there's another line back here that tees off and that goes over to the nozzles on the spindle. So a real simple setup, just a, a bucket with coolant in it, simple impeller pump, uh, a tee, one for the uh, wash down hose, one for the spindle hose. And then uh, there's a return check valve on here too, so the coolant can't flow backwards uh, from the spindle. That's how the coolant turns on so quickly on this machine, because there's a check valve all the way back here. Now the coolant will return uh, on, there's, there's two of these, so these are the return chutes uh, from the machine cabinet. And then the machine has this little metal screen to filter out the big chips so they don't go back in your coolant tank. I'll show, you, I'll show you a little bit later on, I actually put a filter material here to catch even more chips. It's very important to keep uh, chips out of your sump. Uh, if you can see in the bottom here, I just drained this after 18 months of use and there's almost nothing in the bottom of this tank. And that, that's very good. So let's move on to over and look at the spindle and we'll show you where the coolant goes uh, after it exits the hose. So from the coolant pump in the back, the hose comes up the back of the machine, it goes through the top and then curves back around to come down into the spindle head. And it runs through a set of gator tracks uh, to keep the hose from binding up along with all the wires for the spindle motor and everything. Then we've got a, a valve here and then we just have a manifold with my uh, lock fittings, my line locks. And then I also mentioned that I have a wash down, so my wash down hose is over here. So there's my wash down hose. Again, uh, this is a Home Depot special. So just uh, use this and I can shut the ball valve off and then that will direct the coolant through my wash down hose and I can hose my chips off my part. And th this works a lot better than uh, an air hose. and. I think it's cleaner. You don't need a lot of force because the water is so much more dense than air. So you don't have to you know, worry about getting blowback or anything like that. So then once the coolant comes out of the nozzles, onto the tooling and the part, then it just runs down the table through those chutes that we saw in the back and back into the sump. You can see that this machine has a very basic, easy flood coolant system. It's pretty easy to maintain. It's very easy to use. Now, in addition to the flood coolant system, this machine also has an option uh, called through spindle coolant. 
And through spindle coolant is very common on larger machines and it's really used when you're drilling a lot of holes or a lot of deep holes. What it does is it sends high pressure coolant through the center of all the tooling and then it will push the chips out and evacuate the chips out of a blind hole much more efficient and it actually puts coolant at the cutting tip of a drill or a mill. So just to show you how that works, uh, this is a draw bar out of a Fidel machine, but this one is actually damaged. Let's see if we can, come on, there it is. So you can see how this draw bar is damaged. But more importantly, if you look down the draw bar, it has a hole all the way through the draw bar to the other end. And that is how through spindle coolant works. So at the top of the draw bar, there's two grooves in there. Now this lower groove, that is where the retainer ring sits that retains the spring force for the draw bar. The upper groove, if you have through spindle coolant, is for an O-ring. And then there's a piece that will seal over this and allow the draw bar uh, to spin in it for your through spindle coolant. One of the kind of a pain failure modes for these is if this o-ring blows out you get coolant that blows down the draw bar uh, through your uh, Belleville washers and springs and then it flushes all the cool it flushes all the lubricant out of your draw bar so when this o-ring goes you know it's time to do draw bar maintenance. Now that we've covered all the basic parts of a flood coolant system on these machines, let's talk a little bit more detail about coolant maintenance and some of the problems that you can run into. So in the last video we talked about biological growth. And we also talked about why I use uh, Lazar Swiss Lube. They don't have any biocides in their coolant. They actually allow bacteria to grow. But what they do is they formulate their coolant so that good bacteria will grow and by good bacteria growing it starves out the food inside the coolant for bacteria and then the bad bacteria can't grow. But where do bacteria live? A lot of people think that the bacteria actually lives in the coolant and that's true to a certain extent. Some bacteria does live in the fluid of the coolant but the majority of the bacteria in a system is going to be in the sump on the walls of the machine, inside the walls of the tubing and hosing. The bacteria also like to live together. They're a communal type uh, organism. So that's why you get like sludge and slime buildup. It's actually some bacteria that, that's building up. So to maintain your coolant in your sump, one of the most important things you have to do is keep swarf out of it. If you have chips in your sump, bacteria is going to thrive on that. Not because it eats the chips, but it gives it a good home. So I've got something here as well. I don't know if anybody will recognize this. If you have a fish tank at home, you might recognize this. This is called a bio ball. And aquarists use it to grow beneficial bacteria that helps filter out the water. And the whole point of this is that it's loaded with surface area. So just like you would have a ton of surface area on a pile of chips in the bottom of your sump, the bio balls provide a lot of surface area. So by keeping your sump clean, you'll greatly reduce the amount of surface area exponentially that the bacteria have to grow on. So that's why it's so critical to keep chips and swarf out of your sump. If you noticed when I did the tour, I just drained the coolant out of this machine and that coolant's been in there for 18 months, there's almost no chips in the sump. So how do we do that? Well, we filter, okay? Filtering your coolant is very important. Now, where the filter is is also important. A lot of the machines will have filters in two places. One, they'll have a filter when the coolant returns to the sump, and then they'll also have a filter when the coolant comes out of the coolant pump and then goes back into the machine. So I only use a filter on the return of the sump, and what I use is a real cheap, easy, simple solution. I actually found a good use for Harbor Freight rags. So if you go to Harbor Freight, 
you'll find these shop towels. They're uh, 15 bucks on the shelf. If you get a coupon, you can get them for less than 10. So, but if you look at these rags, they, you know, they're hokey. You can see through them. You know, they don't absorb moisture very well. They don't absorb oil very well. They're, they're not that good of a rag. You know, it's Harbor Freight. But they make a great filter. You know, they don't absorb a lot of fluid, so they don't absorb the coolant. And the, and the holes in the mesh are just big enough where it allows the coolant to flow very freely, but it filters out 99% of the schwarf. Okay? So these are a great, great uh, a filter. So I just lay these in the uh, mesh filter screens, and then it provides a, a great filter to, to keep the swarf out of the coolant tank. So along with keeping swarf out of your coolant tank, the other things that you want to do that we discussed before is you always want to keep your coolant moving. Shops that run 24-7 uh, typically get the best coolant life just because their coolant is constantly moving, it's constantly agitated, it stays in a nice suspension. Uh, once you let coolant settle and sit, you'll notice that all this oil starts to float to the surface. And that's the oil trying to come out of the, uh, the suspension. So if you keep your coolant moving, that will also help extend its life. And then as we talked, we also want to skim the oil off the surface of our coolant. If oil gets on our surface, it locks it up, it can't get oxygen, then we get anaerobic bacteria, we get hydrogen sulfide, and it really stinks. So skimming and constant motion is a good thing. So oil skimmers are very expensive. I decided to make my own to save myself some costs. And I mentioned in the other video, it was about a $20 oil skimmer. So let me show you how I make a $20 oil skimmer. First we start with a three or four dollar Rubbermaid or Sterilite bin. This is just a file bin. Okay? Then we take an old worn out end mill that still has a little bit of life at the very top of it and you put it in a drill and you make slots towards the top. I made some on both sides. You can do whatever you want. Okay? Then you take a drill and you drill one hole. And that is your oil skimmer. Okay? Now, after you have the bin, you go to the local fish store again. Uh, I have a saltwater fish tank. And you get something called a powerhead. Now, this one specifically is made by Marineland. It's an MJ400. If you really want to know, you can probably Google it and find it. Um, these range anywhere from $15 to $20. So $5 for the bin, $15 for the pump. You got yourself an oil skimmer. Now, as long as you get one that's rated for saltwater use, it won't have any metal parts in it at all. It will all be plastic and ceramic. So the coolant won't damage it or affect it. One thing I do advise is with these pumps, it's always good to put them on a GFI. If something does happen and the coil in the pump gets exposed to the coolant, you don't want to get electrocuted. So make sure that you put this on a GFI. This is a submersible pump. It's not like the coolant pump in the machine that's not submersible. So then, with the pump, you just put it inside the bin, okay, and uh, run the cord out your coolant tank, and then you stick the nozzle through the hole, like that. So the way, the wor the way that this works is the pump is going to suck water or coolant from the inside of the bin and squirt it out this hole. So hey, now we're agitating our coolant quite well because this is like a 400 gallon per hour pump, I, I don't know, you can look at the specs. So it's gonna, it circulates the coolant very well, keeps it in suspension. Then, because we're drawing water out of the inside and pushing it outside, coolant's gonna wanna go back in. So it comes back in through these slots. So then what happens is you only get a flow across the surface of your coolant into this bin, and then it squirts it out the bottom. So then it concentrates all the oil right in this little area. So then in the morning when you come in, or on a Saturday, when you're ready to run your machine, 
All you do is you take a little piece of plastic that I cut the width of this bin, and you just scoop the oil out, and you're done. And now you've got an oil skimmer for 20 bucks. So last, let's talk about doing a whole do-it-yourself flood coolant system. The benefits of flood coolant is better surface finishes, you know, better cutting action, better chip evacuation. You have a less chance of recutting chips. Uh, you know, mist coolant systems are great for open machines that you can't put a housing around. Uh, but if you can get a flood coolant system, you're going to get a lot better performance out of flood coolant. I know a lot of people in industry say that, you know, flood coolant systems are going away. I really don't think so. You know, material removal rates are only going up. Heat is only being generated more. You know, a flood coolant system is the best way to get the heat out, keep the part at a stable temperature so you get good tolerances. I don't see flood coolant going away. I try to use flood coolant as much as possible. There are some situations where you don't want to use flood coolant. Uh, if you're doing some heavy roughing with some specialty carbide inserts that are coated, they typically don't like flood coolant. You might see some edge chipping uh, from the heat uh, shock and thermal shock as it's entering and exiting the cut. So again, that's, that's something you got to talk to your tool supplier about. But for a simple flood, uh, flood coolant system, all you need is a way to contain the coolant at your work surface. So you need to put a box around your machine and then have a way to drain that coolant back into the sump in the back and then you just need a pump and a hose and some nozzles and you're done you got a flood coolant system now be careful when you're sizing your sump your sump must be large enough so that while your coolant system is pumping coolant out of the sump and into the machine that your sump doesn't empty out before it gets a chance to run back in from the machine okay so that's that's an important thing that a lot of people overlook They'll size the sump a little too small, and then when they turn it on, their pump starts running dry before the coolant can make the round trip back into the sump. For your pump, if you're doing a DIY coolant system, again, go to the fish and pond store. If the pump is rated for salt water, it's not going to have any metal parts into it. It's going to have plastics and ceramics. Most coolants, especially if you stay with the natural mineral oil-based coolants, are not going to attack the plastic or ceramic. So the pump's just fine, and aquarium pumps are designed to run 24-7. You're going to get a long life out of them. They come with a little basket filter so that the chips won't go into them, and even if the chips go into them, they're just a standard impeller type pump. So that's what the impellers look like. So, you know, chips are not going to bother them. And they're cheap, you know, they're 40 bucks to 80 bucks depending on, you know, how much coolant you want to push. So this machine is pushing about uh, 10 gallons a minute, I think I calculated it out as. It's about 600 gallons per hour of, uh, of coolant out of the pump. So, you know, you can easily get a pretty cheap pump uh, to do that. And, you know, hey, if it breaks in a year, for the money that you're paying, you know, it's cheap. These coolant pumps for these machines are pretty expensive. I, I looked at them. So I hope that uh, shows you a little bit more about the flood coolant system and uh, how to make a, a very simple and effective oil skimmer on the cheap. So I hope you enjoy the video and we'll see you on the next one.